Since the last video I posted, I've been thinking about ways to keep making content about competitive nerf and how to make things accessible and provide that information for people that are interested in it and maybe want to give it a try once, you know, games open up in more places again. And while I don't have a whole plan of like how to format everything and do that, I, I don't want to keep sitting on it. So I guess what I want to start with is just kind of a, a short discussion about cost. Uh, because I, I think it's really easy to see tournament footage and see people in jerseys, people with gear, and think, I have to spend a lot to do that. And that's not true. To be upfront, there is a sort of minimum level you probably want to hit in terms of what your gear is. But once you cross that threshold, you'll find diminishing returns set in relatively quickly. But the simple fact is having the highest end gear and the best possible blaster and everything that money can buy isn't going to make you a good player or successful on the field. That's just not true. It may give you some extra creature comforts with your blaster or maybe a little bit of extra power or precision, but if you're not employing those things in a productive way, then you're really just kind of not getting the most out of that extra money spent. So if you want to try and play competitive and see what it's like, uh, maybe you've thought that there was a larger barrier to entry than you may have anticipated it. Like play at the Foam Pro Tour or Ragnar Oktoberfest uh, and, and see how you do to try and you know, find a team and, and get all of that, which we'll get into in future videos on uh, what you can do to prepare for those things. But just again, the concept that you don't need a whole lot to get into this. If you wanted to be a Springer player, you could pick up a Nexus Pro, pop in a Spacer or a new Spring, maybe put on a Scar Barrel, and you've got a perfectly serviceable Spring-powered blaster for competitive nerf. If you want to be a Flywheel player, you can pick up a Strife, get some aftermarket motors and a 3D printed Flywheel cage, LiPo battery and charger, and you're good. Like, you don't need the bleeding edge or the cutting edge of technology for blasters to be competitive. But it's super easy to get caught up in that. And I get it. It's fun. I don't, don't misunderstand me. I thoroughly enjoy seeing all the cool blasters, the new technology, and the fun things that, that can be utilized. But at its core, it's ancillary, it's extra, it's a side benefit. It's not the main course of what you need. What you need is a functioning blaster that gets you around the velocity that you, that you want. You don't need the peak FPS cap. Nobody in our team at Foam Pro Tour was anywhere near the FPS cap. And none of our Springer players, I think, crossed 225 or anywhere close to that but yeah with the FPS cap of 250 we didn't need that we didn't need to push that number to give you an idea of the fact that you don't again need to have the highest numbers the most expensive gear all of that this is just what I can do to drive that point home for you and let's expand that further into gear itself outside of magazines which you will need enough of uh, to be able to actually participate and not be stifled by a lack of available you know darts on hand and things like that you don't necessarily need a lot of it um, I wear a fair amount of gear because I I think it's fun to collect and use and see what works better than the rest though the amount I wear has been lessened as time goes on and it gets more and more refined and like lighter is better in most cases unless you're like strictly a backfield player that's given a lot of darts and you want to just mag dump and you need a lot of ways to carry that but a lot of players on our team don't wear gear like at all essentially and the rest of us kind of wear what we need to to hold the amount of mags that we usually would for a round and not much more because it weighs you down it's extra bulk 
It's extra things sticking out from your body that can get, you know, caught on a piece of cover if you're trying to hug in close and not get tagged or seen. Or uh, It's just less is more in a lot of ways for, for this side of the hobby. So don't think that you need, like, to buy all the coolest gear as well to carry everything because it may backfire on you. Just wanted to point that out because it could seem kind of uh, counterintuitive based on you know me really enjoying gear and kind of messing around with things like that but just don't don't be confused by that just look at a lot of the players on the field in footage of competitive matches a lot of them aren't wearing a ton of gear so you don't need to spend a ton on that now if your role is something where you want to have four mags on you then yeah you may want a, a low-key way to hold and store four mags on you that's not um, interrupting kind of the area you need to move around in. So something compact is probably better. And while compact and out of the way may be important as well, beyond that is actually comfort. What are you comfortable with? Don't change, you know, everything just because you know, certain players or wearing certain things or doing this thing this way or that thing that way. Find what works for you. And this is one of those things we're going to get into in future videos, but just the concept, again, around cost. You don't have to spend a lot to be successful uh, in this side of the hobby, in this hobby, period. Um, but even in this side of the hobby, yes, you may see incremental benefits. And there, there can be a lot of fun to it, you know, as well with the, like tuning your kit like you're tuning your blaster. Uh, but don't think that it is absolutely necessary. It's just a matter of whether or not that incremental benefit is worth it for you. And if you're just getting started, unless you find a lot of fun in it, in that side of it, I'd say it's not worth it uh, until you're really more invested in, in the competitive side of things and, and you're, you know, yeah, I'm really having fun with this. I'm going to do it for, for how, you know, a while. I've got a team and all of that. Like that, that's when you kind of get that idea that, yeah, this is worth investing more into for that little incremental benefit. So what I'm really trying to say here is don't let cost drive you away from trying out this side of the hobby. Phone Pro Tour, I saw people with homemades, I saw people with stock rival blasters manted together uh, for dual shot kind of capabilities, and they won rounds. So it's not like, oh, they were that hampered. Now, their team did have a variety of blasters, but the point is they got to experience competitive nerf and maybe find that minimum threshold for what's effective for them and what they may want to tweak in the future. And it's a learning kind of experience. Every time you go into something new, you learn something from it. While there can be costs associated with competitive nerf if you are looking to start a league of your own, this aspect doesn't have to be the biggest part of it. The player aspect doesn't have to be the most expensive. That's just what I want to drive home here. And as we continue on with this series of videos trying to get information out there about competitive nerf and get more people trying it when things uh, open back up again, I know I'm really looking forward to it. So again, cost does not equal skill. And don't let yourself get carried away thinking that you're going to have to spend a whole lot of money to get a whole bunch of gear and blasters that are at the top of the line to be able to compete. Because you don't. So that said, if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more in the future, feel free to hit that subscribe button. Love to have you around. But that's enough out of me. Thanks for watching. See you next time.